Hello. The battlefields of the 41st millennium have always changed size and scale, whether it's 28mm Space Marines or 6mm Titans. It could be gangs, armies, fleets. But there was a time when the grim darkness of the future could be explored at a scale much smaller than ever before, but also far, far bigger. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today we're exploring the history of 40k narrative skirmish game, Inquisitor. The 2001 Games Workshop game Inquisitor saw players take on the battle for the Emperor's soul. It was described as a large-scale skirmish game, but how can you explain that contradiction in terms? Well, this wasn't the 28mm of the typical Games Workshop game during that time. The miniatures you would play with were 54mm scale. You wouldn't have very many of them, but they were big. Designed by Gav Thorpe, the game took elements of role-playing and skirmish wargaming, offering up intense narrative battles between few participants, with a wealth of storytelling opportunity in every game. And to do so, it elaborated on corners of the 40k universe that had only been lightly explored up to that point. Daily life in the Imperium, the unusual characters who populate it, and of course, the Inquisition itself. Without the game Inquisitor, it's very likely that the 40k universe as we understand it today probably wouldn't exist. Before we delve deeper into the history of this unique Games Workshop game, don't forget that you can like this video if you like it. At the start of the new millennium, Games Workshop were looking for a new specialist game. This was not going to be a core release, it was going to be what was called a secondary, one of the smaller scale, smaller investment games that would get people excited and invested for at least a period of time. And the design studio was given a brief to get as creative as possible. The past couple of years had brought some significant releases, with the 6th edition of Warhammer, the 10mm epic fantasy battle game Warmaster, and the enduringly successful Dark Blanchian fantasy skirmish game Mordheim. The Lord of the Rings license hadn't been acquired by Games Workshop just yet, so in planning ahead for the 2001 release schedule, there was a desperate need for something that would be impressive and that gap created an opportunity for some significant changes to the very fabric of the 41st millennium. So that gap in the schedules would give rise to not just the game Inquisitor and all of the things that that would bring to the 41st millennium, but also the Tau Empire. And as a lifelong Tau player, I'm pretty grateful that there was a gap. And the other ideas that were being explored in the studio to cover that gap were pretty wild and, I've got to say, incredibly interesting. It's almost like any one of these games could have been absolutely amazing. We came up with a bunch of pitches to, to management, to, to Rick and Alan and, and sales management and stuff like that. With like, here's all the stuff we could do. And there were like 10 different ideas, I think. Some of, and I've, I've, I was thinking about this recently. It's like, this was a real, there's a real sliding doors moment between about 1999 in 2001 in the future of 40k in particular but the future of games workshop those two years uh decided huge amounts of how the company would continue from there on in because yeah. of what i'm just about to say um uh both in terms of background but also you know uh the 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 shape of what we ended up doing so so we yeah so we had a bunch of proposals for stuff that could be uh in that slot so one slight sort of like encouraged by Jervis because Jervis always liked you know he liked the 54 mil Wild West role playing was particularly his thing but that idea so that was one of the proposals was basically to do that in 40k because mm -hmm. again despite everything and all the background we did and everything else again Games Workshop is the miniatures come first what is going to be the miniatures offer and actually amazingly sculpted collectible 54 mil miniatures of cool 40k stuff. Mm. is a tick yeah and it was in that context a 54 mil space marine <laughs> big tick yeah just like that was that's the doesn't matter what else you attached to it as, as a sales offer mm. that was the thing it's like 54 mil miniatures are a you know it's like 
there's a category of golden demon right there. There's a da, 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 you know, it's like it's not going to appeal to everybody, but actually, as a specialist game, as a specialist mm-hmm. offer, there's enough appeal there for people to do it. Yeah, from a Minch's first release perspective. So that was one of the things. There was, uh, but there were all kinds of ideas. Uh, Jervis did a uh, Warhammer 47, which was like basically, uh, actually, it's a bit of a, um, so yeah. A classic kind of weird war, weird war two sort of thing that the world, world war two carried over, but actually the aliens landed in 1945 or right. something like that. But actually, it's part of our universe, so it wasn't just the aliens, it's like actually chaos gods were around. So actually, you'd have like corn ape Soviets and da, 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 <laughs> stuff like that. So, yeah, this is what we're talking about. Like, we were just like out there, it's like the brakes are off, just any kind of uh, I did a, I did a 20, 15 mil, 20 mil, can't remember, 10 mil, even. A pitch for redoing Dark Future, but as a more of a war game, right. uh, but in that universe of like, so it's when when corporate takeovers mean using tanks, right. I think was the was the byline for that. And it was a space pirates. Uh, well, it was more of a city fight style style game, but it was more than just a book because there would be like basically forty k on floor plans. And Andy Chambers had this great idea of like using these a bit of a blood bowl turnover impulses kind of thing. So you didn't just necessarily use everything. And it was like room to room fighting on boarding actions, which hmm. funnily enough fullness of time, you know, boarding actions and all that kind of stuff have, have you know, finally made their appearance. Um, revisiting, uh, so redoing Adeptus Titanicus, but the pitch, and this was like an idea that kind of evolved out of Chan to Alan Merritt a little bit. The idea then that the Necrons, who may or may not, but would have been firmly established who were asleep on Mars, wake up. Hmm. So mm-hmm. it was massive Necron war machines versus Titans fighting across the surface of Mars, which right. is very you know, which is the only things that can fight there because it's inexplicable to every other kind of form of like combat and stuff like that. So there was a desire in the business to explore Gav Thorpe's idea for the narrative skirmish game, and to make sure that it did use the larger 54 millimeter scale miniatures because they're cool, and also because this was a time when Games Workshop and its leadership under CEO and later chairman Tom Kirby, was increasingly seeing the core business as something about creating display pieces and not necessarily wargaming components. And a 54mm highly detailed Space Marine absolutely fit that bill. The game is focused on the internal conflicts within the Imperium's Inquisition, an idea that John Blanche credits to a trio of creators. The initial idea of the Inquisition comprising separate factions all seeking power was born from the combined inspirations of Rick Priestley, Gav Thorpe and Alan Merritt. It gave the Warhammer 40,000 universe a resonance which I find irresistible, obscuring the distinction between good and evil. Inquisitor has expanded upon the idea that there is a grey area in between the ideals of the Emperor's order of law and puritanical belief and the warped machinations of chaos. This is the setting, the background if you like, to Inquisitor. There would be no starter box for Inquisitor, instead you would need to get hold of the core rulebook. The book was written by Gav Thorpe with a design concept by John Blanche, and it includes a credit for the Omniscenti, John Blanche, Andy Chambers, Jervis Johnson, Alan Merritt and Rick Priestley, one of the strongest lineups of design support you could possibly imagine. You should be warned that Inquisitor is quite unlike any Games Workshop game you have played previously. This is because Inquisitor is a narrative war game, and works considerably differently to games such as Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000. While in Inquisitor players do have objectives to achieve, and there can be winners and losers, the main aim of the players is to use the rules and miniatures to create characters and a story on the tabletop. That's what it says in the introduction to the rules of Inquisitor. And because it is a story-based game, that doesn't mean there were no rules at all. In fact, there were plenty, covering all of the basics like movement and shooting as you would expect, but delving into a degree of detail and specificity that you might not. Characteristics for a baseline human are typically between 1 and 100, with superhuman beings able to have even higher stats. Dice rolls are performed using a d6, a d10, or a d100. During the turn sequence, players would act in order of their speed characteristic, counting down an initiative tracker so that everyone with speed 100 goes first, and then those with speed 99 get to act, and so on. This immediately gives the game more of a traditional role-playing feel. 
and it doesn't end there. There are different move rates for sneaking as opposed to walking or evading. Shots can be placed when targeting an enemy. Close combat blows can be parried, and injuries can affect specific body parts. There is a lot of detail here. There was a complexity to some of the rules that made it hard for some players to get to grips with, especially at a time when many of the core games at Games Workshop were becoming simpler to play, not more difficult. The game would draw inspiration in many ways from Rogue Trader, but perhaps its most significant rule would be inspired by even older games. In order to play Inquisitor, you would need a Game Master. The Game Master was expected to referee the game, making calls on line of sights or rules judgments. If a scenario was being played, then the GM would set things up and control any NPCs that were on the board. For a miniatures company interested in selling miniatures, Inquisitor was remarkably close to a traditional, albeit combat-centric, RPG. Whilst it's fair to say that the Warhammer Fantasy skirmish game Mordheim owes a lot to Necromunda, it's also, I think, fair to say that it's something of a stablemate to Inquisitor, and that's because both games share the same unrestrained commitment to the Blanchian vision. In both games, John Blanche's art takes centre stage, anchoring and influencing the strong storytelling in these darker and more detailed worlds than we would often see in their respective core games. John Blanche's development art for Inquisitor was so good that it was even released as a limited edition Inquisitor sketchbook. Blanche was joined by artists Alex Boyd, Paul Dainton, David Gallagher, Neil Hodgson, Nuala Kennedy, Carl Kopinski, Stefan Kopinski, Adrian Smith, and Kev Walker. This is one of those GW books that is elevated to such a height of immersion and inspiration because of page after page of incredible illustration, most presented in the magnificent black and white plates that have served 40k world building so well over the years. Stefan Kopinski is also credited with the core book's graphics and layout, and it is a wonderfully realised book. Also, I love this detail. The barcode on the back of the book is in the shape of the inquisitorial rosette. The game launched with several 54mm miniatures available to represent the characters from the core book. These were sculpted by Mark Bedford, Jez Goodwin, Mark Harrison, Gary Morley, Brian Nelson, Alan Perry, and Michael Perry, and they are replete with incredible detail. The scale allows for so much more dynamism and interest than we would often see at the time on some of the smaller miniatures. As well as the heavy metal showcase, there was a second colour section in the book providing modelling guides and pictures of conversions and miniatures made by members of the GW team. Gav Thorpe recalls, This is all about converting and painting and let's get people involved and actually showing true. Some of the miniatures in there aren't the best painted in the world, let's be honest, but they're cool conversions and there's ideas in there. And it wasn't just heavy metal, it was hobbyists doing stuff. Because A, we didn't have the resources of heavy metal to do everything, and B, we wanted to show normal people, <laughs> in very commas normal, but you know, it's like, here's what, here's what, you know, Nelson from production is doing, here's my, here's my wall band, you know, it's like, here's, you know, here's some crazy stuff that Ali Morris has made, and it, like, he, he's a figure sculptor, you can tell, you know, all that kind of stuff, but it's all about ideas. Following the conversions, there was a series of terrain pieces demonstrating the typical board setup for the game. A frequent challenge raised by players would come to be one about the difficulties in converting miniatures, due to the limited number of parts available at the right size, and constructing dedicated terrain, stuff that could be used for this larger scale game. In including the conversion and terrain showcases, it certainly seems that the design team were conscious of these potential issues when making the book, but they remained a thorn in the game's side for much of its life. The biggest thing I think that held Inquisitor about being 54 mil wasn't the models, it was terrain, I think. Right. Doing your battlefields, because it wasn't a huge amount of terrain offer from Games Workshop at the time, really, anyway. A 40k terrain does actually quite translated to full mill quite well anyway but it, but it was just like because you want you know it's quite easy to, to do a few characters but actually because we wanted quite exotic and interesting setups and that's what we did from the outset of like you know the mine and the you know the demon infested ruins and blah, 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 all this kind of stuff but it's like well you want them to, if you want two or three cool setups hmm for your narrative and stuff like that and it's very and making everything in 54 mil and all the rest of it so actually it was hard to carry that through so people end up playing quiz just on their 40k tables with you know 
woods and hills and whatever built. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. th- that was the hardest part to carry through because that was the high. I think that's the highest step in terms of accessibility. The core book also includes tips on games mastering the game, creating scenarios, and building campaigns. And to support that, there are rules for ongoing injuries and gaining experience so that your characters can develop and evolve over time. There is even a pre-made scenario called High Noons, definitely drawing on that Wild West sci-fi 40k vibe. Jervis Johnson recalls his earliest contribution to the game. When I was but a callow youth, I used to play Wild West skirmish games. So when Gav started working on Inquisitor, I searched out all my old skirmish game rulebooks and regaled Gav with tales of the campaign that I had played out some quarter century ago. Because of the nature and the scale of the Inquisitor game, just about all of the methods we had used applied equally well to Inquisitor campaigns as they had to our Wild West campaign. Because of Inquisitor's clear focus on storytelling and scenarios, and the requirement for a dedicated games master, there was not as much of an emphasis placed on warband composition or army list building or points values. This was very much about creating stories through gameplay, and you were expected as players with the games master's help to balance your games through, I guess, the scenarios you were going to play and a bit of common sense. That's not to say that there was no guidance on using points or balancing the game though. There was an appendix, the Ready Reckoner, that provided a simple way to tally the power of characters and the cost of equipment, though it was clearly not designed to be a definitive system. It could not replace the storytelling aspects that you were expected to follow through the scenarios and the campaigns. This was a narrative game through and through. Accompanying the release of the game, there was a new book from Dan Abnett, Xenos, which would chart the investigations of Inquisitor Gregor Eisenhorn from the core rulebook for the game. This would be the first of the Eisenhorn trilogy, a series of books that would come to define a clear understanding of what the Imperium was really like and a different perspective on 40k, one that would become an entry point for an enormous number of new fans. Speaking to the Track of Words blog about the origins of Eisenhorn, Dan Abnett has said, when Games Workshop was creating the Inquisitor game, my editor sent me a photostat of the rulebook a few months in advance. He said, There are some great images in here. You might find it useful for the Gaunt's ghosts. It was really just visual reference for me, but I looked at it and I thought, this is brilliant. I want to write novels about this. I rang my editor up and said, Can I not write an Inquisitor novel just for a change? That would be really good fun. One of the things that really appealed to me was that it's what we refer to as domestic 40k, inasmuch as it wasn't set on the battlefield. Very little work had been put into what life was like beyond it. But Eisenhorn needed to operate in a different place, and it needed to know what life was like in places that the war was guarding. What life was like behind the lines, as it were. As you would expect, Games Workshop's magazine White Dwarf provided additional supporting content for Inquisitor following its launch. There was a wealth of additional coverage in the magazine, with articles covering terrain building, designing themed worlds, scenarios, battle reports, and new characters like the tech priest Tesla. The best of these articles were reprinted in the 2002 Inquisitor Annual. To help Games Masters design settings and campaigns, Games Workshop released three slim scenario supplements under the banner of Inquisitor Conspiracies. These books would include new campaigns with branching narratives, different scenarios, some new rules, dramatis personae, and a new setting with its own lore. The first was The Syrian Legacy by Andy Hall, which provided background on the Syrian system and its ocean planet of Syrian 5, a place given to keeping secrets of the Adeptus Mechanicus. The next Inquisitor conspiracy was Death of an Angel, written by Gav Thorpe and Graham McNeil, which established the planet Charicephalon and its would-be mutant revolution. The third and final conspiracy release was Heavenfall by Phil Kelly, this took the planetary system and primary planet of Equinox as its setting, a once utopia now left with domed cities beneath a polluted forest canopy. 
There was further support for Inquisitor on Games Workshop's website, as well as resharing and reissuing articles and information, scenarios, rules, characters, stuff like that. They would also publish a fully digital supplement, a source book written by Gav Thorpe. This was the Thorian faction. The Thorians are a puritanical faction within the Imperium who believe that the resurrection of the Emperor is possible. It just might need to put him in a new body. The book was primarily a lore supplement, with extensive new material drilling deep into the beliefs, structure and actions of the Thorian faction, and its impacts on the many arms of the Imperium. There were some rules though, including for new psychic abilities and war gear, as well as some example character profiles for Thorian Inquisitors in-game, such as Lord Antigonus Baloradin, expulgator of Toth Prime, and accompanying them there were some new miniatures, including this Thorian Inquisitor. I'm pretty confident this guy was saying this is the way before it was cool. With the establishment of Fnatic, a sub-design team headed up by Jervis Johnson within Games Workshop that had a remit just to control and maintain the specialist games, Inquisitor was moved from being supported by the regular design studio to the Fnatic team. The pages of Fnatic's various magazines would keep the game alive with new scenarios and rules. Initially, through the general Fnatic magazine which provided rules for all of the specialist games, and then under the dedicated Exterminatus title. A second Inquisitor annual was released in 2004 that included the best material from the Exterminatus magazine. Included in these publications were new characters like the Tau Watercast Envoy, Whilst many of the miniatures that accompanied these new character types were fantastic and provided new options for play and conversion, there was a subtle shift in the nature of these characters. In the original series of releases, you could buy and play specific characters, but the Fnatic miniatures took the form of more generic archetypes. Instead of a specific character with a name, you would be more likely to see a generic Krut mercenary or Sister of Battle. In many ways, this less restrictive approach offered more options for players, but as Gav Thorpe explains, it also signified something of a fundamental shift in the way the game was handled. It moved out of the main studio from White Dwarf and into like the Fnatic thing, who had their own amount of resources and, and their own limitations and did some stuff that if I'd been in the meeting at the point, I'd be like, why are you making that? But, but at least gave us a route to, to visit and stuff and, and adding to that range. Um, but I think, except for one or two models, never quite captured the idea of Inquisitor. You know, didn't right. like a pure strange gene stealer was like, okay, but that's from the tabletop. We should do a cool gene stealer thing. It never went, never took the extra step for sure. a lot of their models. Inquisitor received only a single edition, and by 2007, Games Workshop had ceased all official support for the game. It even removed all of the content for Inquisitor from its website. But that was not the end of the story for this game. For many years, there has been a strong community for Inc. 28, a modified version of the game designed to be played with 28mm miniatures, as well as for Inquisimunda, a hybrid version of the game that borrows aspects of Necromunda. The game's creativity, magazines and worlds of the Inc. 28 community and its spin-offs are as amazing as they are plentiful, so I won't get into more detail about them here, but if you want to find out more, then the Ex Profundis website linked below seems like a good place to start. Inquisitor marks an inflection point in the development of 40k and Games Workshop as a whole. It was a game that looked to the roots of the skirmish gameplay that Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000 originated with, and tried to bring that into a modern roleplay story-driven game, one that required far few miniatures, even if they were much bigger, than a regular game of 40k. It would not have a long-lasting mechanical impact on Games Workshop. It was not a game that got many additions or that necessarily influenced the design of lots of other games, but it did have an outsized narrative impact. It started to change the way the 40k universe was written and the way its factions were seen. It drove 40k to a new place. As Gav Thorpe said of Inquisitor in his afterword from the original book, it is a first for Games Workshop, a new scale with a new ethos. For years, successive designers and developers have honed each edition of Warhammer, 
and Warhammer 40,000 to a razor edge, forever striving towards that holy grail of games design, game balance. With Inquisitor, we decided not to bother with any of that at all. It was, um, it was, that was my high, that's my favorite project, you know, both in terms of the legacy it had, but also just the people we worked with and everyone, you know, working with Steph Kapinski, who did all like lots of the layout and very bespoke graphics and all the rest of it. That was like, you know, uh, you know, the effort that went into it. And it was a, and you could tell just for the people working on it, it was a, a creation of, of joy from mm. those people. You know, they just really, it was so 40k and so whatever it was, I don't know, you know, whatever the lightning in the bottle was that we captured was just hit lots of people and and, and the storytelling of it and the games and people just getting behind the idea of it internally. <laughs> um, it just worked, yeah. Inquisitor at its heart is a game about telling stories and the stories that it's given us have absolutely stood the test of time. The 40k universe was forever changed by the lore and background and characters that were in the Inquisitor book. And though Games Workshop has never repeated the experiment, they definitely owe it for all of the things that it did achieve. I hope that you enjoyed this exploration of the history of Inquisitor. I had a great deal of fun researching this unique game and talking to Gav Thorpe. Thanks very much Gav for taking the time, I truly appreciate it. This video was actually chosen by my patrons. If you want the opportunity to help choose what videos, what games I look at next, to see experimental content like my new Hobby Bench podcast before anybody else, and to get exclusive updates and, and other cool stuff, then feel free to take a look at my Patreon via the link in the description below. I would love to have your support if you have the means and inclination. And of course, if you don't subscribe to me yet on the channel here, please do so, it's a great help. And why not let me know in the comments below if you remember playing Inquisitor, what was it like, did you have any terrain, did you have to build loads of scratch stuff, or did you just use books and VHS tapes or whatever else it might have been at the time to make your battlefields. Thank you very much for watching, I am Jordan and this is Jordan Sorcery. I feel like this might have been the first appearance of a cyber mastiff in 40k universe history, but I don't know for sure. And until someone makes a video about every single dog in Citadel history, I guess we'll never know. Though the anniversary of the channel is coming up, and I did make a video about cats. Maybe.